I'm Paul Farber. I'm director and co-founder of Monument Lab. Um, on behalf of the co-director of the Regeneration Project, Sue Mobley, the team at Monument Lab, our board of directors, and our circle of collaborators, I want to welcome you to our second Regeneration Roundtable uh, with the theme of Reclaim. Regeneration is a project happening right now across the country um, where groups of educators, artists, storytellers are leading commemorative campaigns in their own city, town, or region. The Regeneration Project is seeking to work with projects that are rooted in the living history of specific places and find guidance from those on the ground and those with deep experience in collaborative circles. This project is running right now and is supported by the Mellon Foundation's Monuments Project. Um, you can learn more about regeneration on our website. Um, I also, on behalf of the project team, I'm gonna share that there's a new project map that's available through our, our website as well that marks a remarkable group, including two of our collaborators from Rapid City and Queens, New York, um, that are here present tonight. The Regeneration Roundtables are all moderated by Dr. Matt uh, Jordan Miller Kenyatta um, and um, feature a range of regeneration collaborators um, from projects and also those who were in conversation with partners um, and other members of the Brain Trust. Um, I do want to note before we begin and before passing off um, to Dr. Matt, who will be able to lead us through an introduction of our illustrious panel, um, that this is especially heavy week um, with profound challenges to bodily autonomy for women and other birthing people, to tribal sovereignty, um, to, of course, um, gun violence that continues to plague our country. Um, this is a heavy moment amidst many other heavy moments. Um, and we take that and we take that seriously. And we also think about first and foremost, our groups of collaborators, artists, and storytellers and educators who have been doing this work long before there was a spotlight on it and will continue to through challenge and try to seek guidance from their perspectives, their visions, and their stories. So without further ado, I want to hand over to our fantastic and thoughtful host, Dr. Matt. Hello, everyone, and um, thank you, Paul, for that, that really thoughtful um, introduction and um, the invitation to be part of this uh, amazing series that uh, Monument Lab has put together. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to, to really be in community with people, as, as Paul mentioned, in, in such tough times um, and draw closer toward, toward things that really represent our values in the built environment. So uh, just before I introduce the panel, uh, the panelists that um, I'm really excited to, to co-curate a conversation with, um, a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm a geographer, uh, I'm a storyteller, and I'm an urbanist. Uh, I work at the intersection of place, taste, and urban change. Um, and I, I direct our justice and belonging initiatives at the School of Design at uh, University of Pennsylvania. So. Um, but today I'm here really as, um, as just a curious mind as to the amazing work that is going on um, all across the country for this regeneration series um, and focused around the question of, and the provocation really of reclaim. Um, <clears throat> so um, that a little bit about me, uh, I want to now sort of invite our, um, and I'll say before I actually bring the panelists in, um, this is the second of three panels that uh, we're having this summer. So uh, thank you all for everyone who's come to this, but I'll, and if you're repeat visitors, uh, thank you for coming again. Um, hopefully you will be with us again for our third conversation next month. Uh, and so that, with that being said, I want to invite um, the, our, our, our amazing panelists to uh, sort of join uh, and turn on your, 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 your screens, if you will. Um, and I'm just pulling up the information about, about them just to ground us in who's really, uh, who, who we all really have the, the amazing honor to, to learn from today. So starting with uh, Liz Ogbu, uh, 
Liz is a, a designer and urbanist and a spatial justice activist who is an expert in engaging and transforming unjust urban environments from designing shelters for immigrant day laborers in the US to a water and health social enterprise for low income Kenyans. Liz has a long history of working with uh, communities and leveraging uh, the power of design to, to community healing, foster environments to support people's capacity to thrive. Excuse me, uh, my allergies are a little bit uh, <laughs> off today. Um, she's the founder and principal of Studio O, a uh, multidisciplinary design consultancy that works at the intersection of racial and spatial justice. Uh, she's held numerous amazing academic appointments from Berkeley, Stanford's D School, I'm biased toward that, that's my alma mater, <laughs> uh, and UVA. Uh, her projects have been featured in museum exhibitions and publications globally, including at IDO as a global fellow, TED speaker, Aspen's ideas, uh, and, and, and so much more. Um, and of course, her degrees are from architecture uh, from Wellesley and Harvard University. So uh, thank you, Liz, for, for sharing time with us tonight, uh, or today, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, Orlando Serrano, uh, a junior, is uh, the manager of the National Museum of uh, American History's educational programs for, for young people and their educators and caregivers. Uh, Dr. Serrano is an educator with practice in teacher professional development, assessment, instruction, and educational technologies. His research and writing has been funded by a Ford Foundation Fellowship, which are really hard to get, <laughs> so shout out. Um, National Science Foundation EDGE SBE grant, which are also very hard to get. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Serrano's work uh, centers the relationships between race, space, and place, as well as environmental justice. Um, all right, so a uh, couple more folks here. Jacqueline Reyes is a visual and, and performing and teaching artist, as well as a designer and cultural organizer based in New York City. She earned her BFA in art photography from Syracuse University and her master's degree in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. <clears throat> she is a 2022 mentor with the New York Foundation's Art for Immigrants Artist Program, uh, a 2021 and 22 art commissioner with Queens Council. Uh, same here, at least here in Philly, I'm an art commissioner. Um, uh, and a 2021 awardee with the Laundromat Projects Creative Action Fund a recipient of numerous awards um, in Focal Media Arts work, in Progress Award, the Wave Farms 2021 Media Arts Assistance Fund, the 2020 Asian Women's Giving, Giving Circle Grant. Um, and one of the main projects that uh, Jacqueline is, is, is known for, and I, I believe is a part of this regeneration project is um, her work as, a, as an artist in residence with the Laundromat Project, which she co-created with uh, as a creative placekeeping intervention with the Little Manila Queens uh, Bayan Hayan, Bayan Hayan? <laughs> uh, you'll tell me how to pronounce that in a sec. Uh, uh, Bayan Hayan Arts in Woods, Woodside, Queens, uh, which includes the Meal to Heal Initiative, uh, the Little Manila Street co-naming initiative, and, and many others. Um, and th there's so much more in your bio. I'm just going to leave it there for now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, amazing, amazing story um, behind Jacqueline here. Uh, lastly, we have Amy Sazu, who is a uh, Sikangu Ogolala Lakota community organizer who's lived in Rapid City for the last 20 years. Uh, in her own words, she says, as a Lakota woman, my passion is creating an equitable community for everyone, a place where my children, my relatives, and all Indigenous people feel welcome, seen, and heard. I was born and raised on the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservation and have great pride in my homelands, my ancestry and my people. I've worked with native nonprofits in Rapid City for the last 15 years and value the relationships that I have built with the indigenous community and the understandings I've able to build with the non-native community. I believe that all the work happening in our community is uh, yet to come and it is time for indigenous people to step into our power as the decision makers, the influencers and the geniuses that we are. Um, and this is a really sweet part of your <laughs> bio, but you married your best friend and partner for life, Tracy Sazu, and have four beautiful children and two brand new grandbabies. And everything that her, her work is, 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 is for them. So um, I, I'm, I'm really happy you shared that part of your, your, your story in your life as well. So um, all that being said, I, I'm really excited to get to know um, more about you all's journeys. So just 
alphabetically here. Um, one, you all, know, just if you could, you know, we, we've heard the highlight reel, right? Like we've heard these, these amazing accomplishments that you all have amassed and, um, you know, bold ambitions, audacious ambitions that you all have embarked on. But like, what's, how did you begin? You know, how did you begin these projects that brought you to Monument Lab, to the Regeneration series? And um, I want to maybe kick it off with, uh, with Liz, um, if, if you maybe want to add some, uh, some color in between the lines of those highlights. Like, how did, how did all that begin for you? Sure. I just also want to note how rare it is that starting with the last name of O, that I ever am the first in the alphabetical I, order. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, she's really the first? The alphabetically? Wow. OK. We have a lot of R's and S's in the room. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's cool. It's cool. I'll try this position. It's new for me. Um, but uh, it's an honor to be with all of you. And I'm so excited for the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, I was joking in the virtual back room that uh, my start into the work that I do just happened because I was the weird child in my family who drew. Um, I grew up in a family of social scientists. My father was an anthropologist and my mom was involved in public health. And so Growing up, we talked a lot about people and just um, how they lived, how they related. And so that was like really my understanding of the world. I just had this weird drawing thing that I did. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to school and decided to study architecture, for me, I couldn't understand how to talk about the built environment without talking about the people who were gonna live in the built environment and what their stories were. And yeah. so I really started to craft a, a an education and a practice built around that because I wanted to understand how to knit those things together. And I feel like that really led me to a practice that was focused on who often gets excluded out of conversations about the built environment, but who often gets impacted negatively by decisions that are made within the built environment. And so that continually led me to a variety of nonprofits where um, we were sort of pioneering what it meant to do that in this space. And then to my own consultancy, looking at these issues. And I would say that as I started really diving deeper into this and working in communities around the world, but particularly communities of color, one of the things I really became interested in is this idea of spatial justice, which effectively means that justice has a geography. And it's sort of asked that equitable access to resources, opportunities, and outcomes should be a basic human right. And we know the reality is that that often is not the case, especially in communities of color. And so I began to look at, well, what would it mean for my practice to be oriented around spatial justice and a spatial justice to be like a partner to this idea of racial justice. We can't actually achieve racial justice as long as we are separated and selectively harmed by space. So unless that is my intentional goal, like I'm not actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so I really started to, to steer my projects in that direction, look for clients that would support that. And I would say the last sort of ingredient that underpins the work that I do is I actually came a couple of years ago, I was at a community meeting um, in a community I've been working in for years, had a really good relationship. It's a historic working class African-American community here in the Bay Area. And I had the worst community meeting I have ever had in my career. And a lot of the structure of the meeting was not set up by me, but it was this moment where I was like, but we've been doing good work in this community for years. Why, why are, like, what am I seeing here? And and there's a poem um, by Nair Wahid that says, anger is grief that has been silent for too long. And I realized that in seeing all the anger that came up in that meeting, there was a lot of grief and it was unprocessed grief. And so one of the things that I've been pulling into my work as we talk about not just spatial justice, but like you can't actually hold what it means to work for spatial justice unless you're willing to also hold the grief that comes from all the harm that has been perpetuated up until this point. And so how do we frame our projects and frame the work we do in communities in a way where it's not just that we're looking ahead to that beautiful thing that we're going to create, but also part of, I guess you would say the reclaiming is that we also have to hold space for grief, that that is also part of the conversation and healing is part of the conversation. So that's really where a lot of the projects and the work that I do now is oriented both around justice, but that a partner to that is grief and healing. And I'll, I'll stop there. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, 
you, you set us up great for the next part of this conversation, but I want to hear from other people as well. How did, how did, how did you all get, get, what brought you to these projects that you're working on now um, for this series? So um, I think Orlando or Dr. Serrano, you let me know which one you prefer um, would be next in line here. I thought I had a little bit more time uh, <laughs> because Jacqueline Reyes is before me. But that's oh, okay. got it. I was, okay. making, I was making my notes. Um, no, Orlando is fine. Um, thank you, thank you, Dr. Matt. Um, so I and so I was trying to pare pare down the narrative as much as possible in terms of like how I ended up doing the work that I'm doing in the institution and the center within the institution that I'm at. So long the longest way to trim the easiest way to turn the story is like I went to a school right um trained as a as a human geographer with wonderful people um and when I was on my way out I you know did the go do the job talk situation right I went to several campuses and I did not care for it um quite frankly and towards the end of it, you know, I had to sit down to, and have a conversation with my dissertation chair and say, you know, you're right, I got these very difficult to get fellowships and scholarships <laughs> and grants um, to do a particular kind of research, but, you know, it, it didn't feel like I was going to be sort of using all of, and this sort of gets into like, who am I accountable to, right? Like, you know, it's hard for me to separate this, right? Yeah. But it was very difficult for me to, go into an academic setting um, and really think of that as a redistribution of all kinds of resources that were put into me, right? As someone who came from a working class community, kid of immigrants, it just didn't feel like the right move. Um, and I originally wanted to be a high school teacher and that's what I ended up doing for several years. Um, mm -hmm. And working with kids in Columbia Heights, um, immigrant kids, English language learners, um, really, Sort of using a lot of my training to have frank honest conversations about this place you know that we call the united states and how we all ended up here uh, as a as a literary nonfiction teacher that's what i thought and um during that time one of my fellow um grad school folks said hey we have this position at american history you might be interested in it allows you to work with teachers, uh, work with students, but then also use some of you, your academic training with exhibit development, other projects that might be going on. And so I ended up working out that way. And so for the last five years, I've been, and, and to be clear, the reason I, I moved out of the classroom to take that, this position in American history was really to think about um, and think through, right? Like how to use the, the collections and the archives that we have established in that museum sort of like against itself and against the grain um, and to mm -hmm. sort of bring to the surface histories that have been silenced right by using objects that have been used in a particular way in unconventional and new ways that people just haven't thought about um, and then crafting resources for teachers and students um, built around you know sort of what I would call, right, like decolonial or abolitionist thinking. And during that time there, uh, a few folks um, started putting together uh, something called the Center for Restorative History, um, led by uh, Dr. Sion Wold, I mean, Sion Wold Michael and Dr. Nancy Burkhoff. And they, you know, sort of invited me in um, to, to think through how some of the principles of restorative justice or transformative justice might be applicable in a classroom setting. Um, how a pedagogy might be able to be established around these ideas and thinking, but also to think about how to engage in all the members of the different societies and diasporic, you know, groupings of people who we're all working with through the Center for Reserve History, you know, and establish reciprocal relationships where we're not sort of like reproducing the extractive nature of museums. Yeah. Right, yep. um, but that we're we're um, contributing. So that is the the how I ended up doing the work that I'm doing now. That's deep. <laughs> that's the short answer. Like that's that's there's a lot 
to unpack there. Um, <laughs> Wow, yeah, the, the recipro reciprocalness is what is sticking with me a lot um, with that. I appreciate the praxis along with the framing. Um, they seem to work really well together. So thank you, thank you for um, telling your story out of order as well. <laughs> but um, so Jacqueline, uh, what, what about you? How, what brought you to your projects and, and work? Uh, yeah. Oh, you went back on mute accidentally. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> I was just gonna say I'm, I'm pretty impressed so far. I'm just an amazing panel to be a part of. So thank you to all of you in the Monument Lab. Um, so I guess I'll start with how my work in like uh, Little Manila, Queens, New York, how it started. Um, my collaborator, Zinia Diente, who I work closely with in this work, um, we both were um, artists in residence with the Laundromat Project. And for those who don't know who the Laundromat Project is, they do a lot of community-based art uh, work and they support artists like through just uh, even beyond the residency and everything, they, they uphold a lot of the social practice work that happens here in New York City. So we were lucky to um, have a residency with them in 2020. Um, and we had initially proposed a public art festival um, in Little Manila to activate um, that neighborhood and bring art into that neighborhood. And then, of course, in 2020, uh, the pandemic hit. Um, and that was when Xenia and I decided that we needed to pivot our project, that we weren't going to prioritize um, art, um, even though it's important, we know it's important, but we wanted to prioritize the, the basic needs of our community during that time. Um, and what we know and what a lot of Filipinos know um, is that a lot of us are here because of the healthcare workers who came over here from the Philippines and then started um, the diaspora communities that exist today. Uh, mm -hmm. And with that, we were, were like, let's pivot and let's focus on the healthcare workers. We know that we're going to be severely impacted. Um, and also just the neighborhood where it is um, in, in Queens, it was just a few blocks from, uh, from Elmhurst Hospital, which was um, the epicenter of the ep epicenter during the first wave. So um, just thinking just like historically and, and geographically, we're, we're just like, we need to kind of go in there and see what we can do as artists. And for us, it was about um, storytelling and listening to the stories, but also doing the basic thing, uh, which was a, a mutual aid initiative, which you highlighted in my bio, we called it Meal to Heal. Uh, and what we did basically with other community organizers was um, raise money to bring money to the small businesses, because we know that like, uh, if they were to fail that bigger companies could kind of swoop in and gentrify the space so we wanted to kind of prevent any displacement of our community so we raised money um organized delivery deliveries between filipino restaurants to deliver to healthcare units all over the city where we knew there were filipino healthcare workers and from there um because we were coordinating with a lot of community organizers we were also doing a little bit of uh, interviews and oral history um, to better understand what people were thinking and feeling during this very disastrous time. Um, and uh, after each delivery, we would organize um, reflection sessions with each other and just kind of ruminate on the, like just what was happening, but also like um, really try to expand what we defined as care um, in our community. And if it's not just personal care, it's like what care is needed right now, what care is missing. Um, and we've reflected on the word bayanihan, the word that you were stumbling upon earlier. Um, it's, in, it's in the name of the group. So we call ourselves uh, Little Manila Queens Bayanihan Arts. So Bayanihan, yeah, Bayanihan. Um, so it's, it's a Filipino tradition that comes from like rural Philippines where basically um, if you've got a house and you need to move it somewhere, you get your neighbors, your friends, your family to actually lift the house. It's usually like a hut. Um, and then you'd actually physically move it but it's become a metaphor for a lot of Filipinos to mm. for collective effort from mutual aid essentially. Um, and so that's what we were trying to do to try to bring creative practices to amplify those stories, amplify those voices. Um, and I think that um, not only was it really helpful and it brought people together, but it also taught us a lot about what was more, like how, how much deeper we needed to go in the work. Mm. Um, and um, with that, like, uh, you know, we, Basically, we were like, okay, we need to like look at the pattern of, of like who's carrying the burden of care. Most of the time, it was a lot of times it's the women doing the work. It's the it's the women um, yeah. in the community who are um, bringing the people, bringing the family members from the Philippines over here. 
Um, and we know that it's not just like some coincidence that happens to these specific women um, from the Philippines um, coming over. Uh, we know that it was the result of policies, um, both in the US and the Philippines that enabled that, um, and that created um, basically Philippines greatest export, which is Philippine labor, I mean, female labor. Um, so with this monument project, when this regeneration opportunity came up, we we're like, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about like how history, um, like imperial history is related to care and the shortage of care and that pipeline. Um, and we wanted to visibilize that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, um, my head's going a lot of different directions with um, how you, what, what, what your journey has been. And I'm thinking a little bit about just, um, just the, the characterization in some ways of, you know, art and um, basic needs in that and how you found ways to sort of weave the two together. Because I know, I mean, when you're not, focused on how to feed yourself, like mental health and all of that, you, you're you trying to find ways to heal and, you know, put yourself back together again to keep going out and survive in this crazy world. So like, um, I think it's amazing to see how social practice art can can do that, like really weave that together. So thank you for, sh for sharing that. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Amy, what, how, how, what's, what's your journey? How did you get to the work that you're up to now with, um, particularly with regeneration? Hi, you know, I was just thinking about it while everybody else was talking and I think my journey here really started with wanting to know more about myself, learning about myself, where I, who I am, where I come from, and then understanding what this place, you know, what, what um, this place, this city, you know, Rapid City, but also in a larger context, you know, the Black Hills and this, this part of South Dakota, like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to me? And um. And so a lot of it started there, you know, understanding that um, historically that uh, Lakota people believe that we came from Wind Cave. So we believe like our emergent story, like we literally came from the Black Hills. Um, and then my family has lived here generationally and always has um, as like a hub or a place for more opportunity for housing and jobs and, and education. And so um, even my dad and my grandparents lived here. Um, and in trying to understand those stories and myself, um, combined with my work experience, you know, working with the Indian community here in Rapid City for so long and seeing that our community is very divided and like trying to understand why, like why, mm. um, where, you know, when we talk about the missing narrative in Rapid City, it is Indian people, it is, it's our existence here, it's our history, our connection to this place. And so as I'm like trying to learn all of that, taking my work experience, <laughs> um, my our co-founders or my partners, you know, our group was, this story was starting and I started listening. You know, half of our community did not want to hear the story. The other half was saying, we've been telling that story. And so it was just a really unique opportunity to join that, you know, the storytelling and to tell this story and to combine um, oral history, which is a Lakota value and um, practice with independent research to say that what our ancestors, what our community has been saying is absolute truth. And we know that it doesn't take, you know, independent research for us to believe our elders, but that's what it takes for the rest of our community to believe our story. Um, and so just always, you know, I do things in the community. I'm a commissioner for our human relations commission. I'm on, you know, different boards in the community. And it's always the Indian voice that's missing. Indian people, mm -hmm. indigenous people, the people who have existed, you know, here in this space before this space existed. Um, and so just looking for ways that we bring that narrative where I can make space um, for my community or for other people who have been carrying the burden of, of these stories or the, these this knowledge that our community has held. Um, and like, how can I help? How can I amplify that? How can I um, make it legit, you know? And, and which is a frustrating <laughs> idea, but we do, we have to legitimize our own cultural knowledge and teachings. And, and so um, I've been, that's been my involvement. It's always been my involvement is like, how do I, make this space how do I make sure our people our voices are heard and mm. this um and so you know going to to um DC a few months ago it just I was like that is why that that is why we fit so well with this project because 
the story of the Rapid City Indian Boarding School in Rapid City is an un, is still an untold story. Yeah. And with the with the um, movement around Carlisle and Kamloops and like this bigger, you know, and the initiative by Deb Holland, you know, to look into the history of the boarding schools, our project is 10 years, 10 slow years ahead. Um, because we've been doing this work, we've been doing our research, we've been planning, we've been working on, you know, a reclamation of the story of the land that that boarding school was on, and of our own history here. And so that's how our group landed here. Um, I was a volunteer. My background is a teacher. I was a teacher for 10 years and jumped into nonprofit work, um, you know, grant writing with that same idea, like, how do we tell our story from our perspective? Um, and was a volunteer with the project. And we, you know, started moving towards like, we need to pay people to do this because we're a volunteer group of like 100 people of 30 solid doing free work. And so um, I'm just extremely blessed and lucky to be part of this group and to be, you know, representative of the work that we're doing in our community. Yeah, no, I, that, that's a blessing to hear, to hear how this fits with like the, the traditions and rituals you, you've already been upholding. Um, and yeah, yeah, every, everyone's comments is triggering different things. Like Liz's, I was like, oh, I'm from the Bay Area too. And like, Amy, you're talking now about like, you know, um, the burden of keeping your sort of ancestors stories alive. And my grandfather, when he passed, I learned so much about his story and I'm working on that personal archiving work as well. It's a lot, it's a lot. So uh, hats off to you. Um, so, so I want to ask this question to everybody and you all can jump in however you, you, you feel the spirit move you. Um, and some of you already addressed this in some ways, but we can put a finer point on it. So when it comes to your work, like, you know, who are you most accountable to? Um, who are the, what's, what's part, so this panel really we're getting into thinking about public memory and thinking about public space and storytelling. Um, and I always like to, I nerd out about the idea of publicness a lot because I think it's important to be specific about which public you're either speaking for, to, or with. Um, and, and so I, when I ask, you know, who are you most accountable to, like what, which public comes to mind um, if you had to imagine them um, as, as a specific kind of person or specific kind of experience? Like, and how has that changed over time for you? Is it the same as when it started for you or has it evolved? I can start or jump in. Um, I think from the very beginning, we our project has been accountable to the elders in our community who carry this story um, and making sure. And so we do that. We, we make sure that we stop and check in. We make time and place and space to communicate with our elders, with our community. But mm -hmm. what I'm seeing now is that there's this interest in like a handoff. And now the focus isn't so much on being accountable to our ancestors, but being accountable to our children. And like, how do we how do we make sure that this these stories stay alive? And so there's been a lot of conversation about like lesson planning and curriculum development um, and public, you know, we have a documentary that we'll be having a public showing on July 30th and like their focus turned to including youth and like, how do we make sure young people are there and that they're understanding this story and understanding where they fit and like mm -hmm. carrying that story. And so it's been neat to see like this generational focus move from you know our elders and being accountable to people who some who aren't here anymore um to to our next generation and a handoff of of that knowledge it's like transgenerational in a way yeah i i, I think for folks who do like that long long-term storytelling work that happens you know like people pass away and you're like oh my gosh like I always thought this was going to be a thing but when it happens you're like oh wow yeah you got to really um invest in, in the future with with that knowledge um yeah who other publics um that you all think of or that you feel most accountable to in your projects I'm happy to go um you know I work as a consultant primarily, so I'm, I'm not embedded in a nonprofit and I work in a lot of different communities. And so working as a consultant, there's always like a really clear client. And within architecture, you're usually beholden to the person who's hired you, who's cutting the check and all that stuff. And I always operate on the 
premise that, um, especially because, you know, having justice as my aim and grieving and healing, my belief is that um, my clients are the people who are most impacted by whatever it is that I do. Mm, mm. And they are not necessarily the ones who are going to be hiring me. Um, and the process is often set up to honor those who are cut in the check and not necessarily those who are impacted. So part of my process ends up being, how do I create space at the table so that both our understanding of what the context is that we need to respond to and the decisions that get made are driven by those who are most impacted and not that they just happen to get whatever is decided by a select few. Um, but I also want to speak to what Amy said in terms of thinking about the next generation. You know, kids are often not the ones who are showing up to your community meetings or any of the things that would be driving. And yet they are the ones who inherit whatever it is that we create. And so um, I also firmly believe in creating processes that allow us to like bring kids to the table and actually assigns value to their voices and what they say and starts to prep them to be stewards of these places because they are the ones who inherit it. And so that's definitely a, a broader remit than I think everybody thinks of when they think about doing this kind of work. But I actually feel like those they're really important to this long-term success of anything that happens. Yeah, and um, I actually, uh, I started volunteering at this recreation center in West Philly and uh, a woman corrected me, an elder, and was saying she doesn't call them kids, she calls them young people. And um, one, one thing that, that helped me see was like, wow, like, you know, I mean, you can tell when a kid turns three years old, like they are fully formed, <laughs> like personality and they have their preferences and everything, but somehow in the systems they get lost as fully formed people that are just younger, you know, and, and they're going to be stewards as, as, as they, as they grow up and inherit the world we create. So I, I love that, 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 that thought process in your, um, um, and I, I imagine that takes a really interesting, uh, business model <laughs> to attract a client that wants to actually like allow space for those types of, um, interactions and, and, um, accountability, you know, accountability measures. I mean, it does, but I, I will just say, like, I think that, I mean, the folks who wind up as my clients, they often wind up because the way in which they've been business as usual, it very clearly does not work. And so you have to be willing to look in a different direction. And so that's usually who winds up on my doorstep. But also, I think one of the things when we talk about these different groups and who gets to come at the table, often why it doesn't work is because we've set up conditions where the relationships between these groups are transactional. Yep. And so I think part of the commitment to, and I imagine for all of us here, part of the commitment of how we do the work is it's about relationship building. If you're in relationship with people, then you trust that they have a right to be at the table. And so part of that, what I end up doing, and I imagine what everyone here on this panel ends up doing is like, in some ways you are a curator or steward for supporting relationship building so that there can be the trust that this person, whether they're age five or age 80, has something to say of importance to the long-term stewardship of this piece of land. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick and, and sort of speak a little bit about the, the structure of the, you know, the Center for Restorative History. We sort of operate as a collective. So there are six different projects that are that sit under the umbrella of restorative history. And each project, you know, inhabits and um, sort of dwells in a deep sense of accountability to the communities who they're working with, right? Um, whether it's um, folks in, you know, undocumented organizers in North Carolina, uh, farm workers in South Carolina, um, folks out in Nebraska who are running a community center. Each of the projects is very, is very, much committed to ensuring that as a museum that is working with these communities to not um, not sort of register or mark a tally for a particular kind of story, but to let the story stand on its own 
exclusive of necessarily a larger narrative that the museum might be trying to tell about what American history is, right? Like this is a history of these folks in this community okay. in this place. Um, that is who, who, you know, we all feel most accountable to, whichever community we're working with. And, you know, where my weird role comes in is, you know, working with these stories um, to craft and, I, and I'm really happy to hear, um, you know, everyone talking about younger folks um, and the important role that they fill in our present um, as sort of gatherers of knowledge and stories, um, not as empty receptacles, but of active shapers, right, uh, uh, of of the the story that they're a part of. So. How to, how, how to be honest with young folks when talking about um, the history of Grand Island, Nebraska and why it is that this community lives in this neighborhood and not in another neighborhood, right? To talk about um, housing practices and loaning practices and banks, right? Um, yeah. To be both precise and truthful in, in the kind of learning that we do. Yeah, I, I would love to, um... And I think I'll circle back around this because I have questions for individuals and then we have to open it up for Q&A soon. It's time just flies so quickly. Um, Jacqueline, did you want to chime in here on this question of Publix? Um. <laughs> yes, um, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I, I agree with what everyone was saying, um, especially it being intergenerational, like who, who I feel accountable to, um, but also like who isn't in the room, like just, you know, the intersectionality, making sure that like we're looking at the different classes of people who don't get to participate in decision making. Um, but because I work in an immigrant community or a transnational community, I also have to think about like the Filipinos back in the Philippines and that the sort of knowledge and the sort of culture that they operate under because their, their view of us uh, in the community here is very different than how Americans view us. So like for me, I'm like, I feel like I'm code switching all the time and trying to, to layer all of that together <laughs> while still trying to maintain the integrity of the work as, as best as possible. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I operate. It's like oftentimes the how, right? It's not just the what and the who. Um, and then like, because we work like in placekeeping, um, Little Manila is mostly like one block in Queens and we share that block with a lot of other communities. So I also mm -hmm. feel like we're, accountable to our neighbors like we're, we're not we're just like one of many immigrant communities we share that space with Bangladeshi people um the Latine uh, community as well so um you know even though um, we see ourselves as marginalized community I think also making sure that our impact is also you know being considered um no matter what we do um so yeah again it's back to the how yeah no and and um I really appreciate you you elucidating those nuances um, and space and, and across communities as, as well. Um, I, I came from LA and there's a lot of sort of like ethnic enclaves that are named after a certain group. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned Bangladeshis and I was thinking of like little Bangladesh is in the same area as Koreatown, which is in the same area as like, there's all these like juxtapositions that are like global, you know, and um, people get there and they start to claim spaces. And so I, I kind of want to get into the, a little bit of this with y'all because this theme, this panel is themed Reclaim. And I just want to read a quote from uh, Scholar. I really appreciate how she frames this. Um, she asked the question, what politics is possible outside the grid of secure possession and sovereign self? Um, this is Ananya Roy in her, her article, Dispossessive Collectivism, or Property and Personhood at City's End. Um, and so this idea of dispossessive collectivism really sits with me. And I think, uh, Alondra, you'll, you'll appreciate this as well as a human geographer, um, is sort of thinking about this idea of, of like finding a way to be, you know, um, in the world and not necessarily um, reproducing this idea of property, which, you know, property as, as whiteness, whiteness is property. You know, we, we've heard, heard that from uh, Cheryl Harris. Um, a little bit more on that quote, though, she says, such politics seeks to liberate, I'll say, space, she says homes, I'll say space, from commodification while also practicing emplacement. Such politics uses postponement as a strategy oftentimes, but is acutely aware of the protracted histories of persistent exclusion and deferred reparation. So just think, I'm, I'm sitting with this quote because this idea of reclaim um, 
it's, 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 a, it's an interesting provocation because in one sense, you're trying to find and in place the loggingness for people, but also recognizing the mechanisms by which we've inherited of, of belongingness often are exclusionary. And so how, how, how wrestling with that, I say all that to say, like I completely empathize with this struggle of like, how do you claim space for people um, knowing that it's excluded us by these same means? Um, uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. And so I wanted to ask a couple questions to y'all on this note. Um, Jacqueline, you know, your project, you, you were going um, the Little Manila Street uh, renaming. Um, how, how, how did that go and what, what experiences did that come bring, bring to mind for you that day? Yeah, so it's it's not a renaming, it's a co-naming. Like we can't co-naming. Okay, yeah. love that. Well, which is which is interesting because I think yeah. it kind of speaks to what you're you're talking about just earlier. So um Little Manila in Queens is it's on Roosevelt Avenue. And Roosevelt Avenue is like the longest like street that has like all these businesses. And when you it's also below the seven train, which for New Yorkers every subway stop on the seven train it's like a different ethnic enclave so it's known for like good food every stop you go mm. um with that being said um you know leading up to the street co-naming event which we had on june 12th um which is a couple of sundays ago we we um, intentionally scheduled it to be on philippine independence day because we wanted to kind of juxtapose that moment in history with the juxtaposition of roosevelt and Little Manila being like in the same sort of headspace. So mm -hmm. um, just for a quick quick history of, of, of the Philippines, uh, June 12th is the Independence Day from Spain, um, which we got the independence um, alongside Americans um, thinking that they wanted to save people like us from Spanish uh, colonialism, but then they decided to colonize us after. So it's, it's our day of freedom, but it's, it's you know, it's very loaded, right? Um, and then Gee. Yeah, and then Roosevelt, um, it's named after the two presidents, um, Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, they're both figures that kind of bookend the American colonial period in the Philippines. So it kind of shows that like, um, you know, even though Philippines is a country on the opposite side of the world, um, the, the reach of the US of US foreign policy is very, very um, broad, right? Um, so we wanted to kind of just you know, bring that together because um, I think a lot of people think just as immigrants, we, we're not part of we're not part of U.S. history when in fact we are because they've long been part of our history. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was reflecting on that day, and it's it's when it was revealed, it was really amazing to to see that the little Manila like just being like written above, and you know, just locally, um, all the businesses were really excited um, about it just to just be recognized after all these years, decades of being there, um, contributing to the city, whether it's the restaurant workers or the healthcare workers. Um, but yeah, like it, it, with the question of reclaiming, it's just like, hey, let's just suppose these two histories next to each other and let's kind of question who this Roosevelt or who the Roosevelt's are and like what they did in other places beyond the US. And that's powerful, yeah, yeah. Um, Orlando, I want to kind of turn this over your direction a little bit too, because you've used in this uh, concept yeah. of restorative history, and I, I'm trying to sit with that in 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 relationship to reclamation. Um, I have another quote in mind, but I'll I'll, I'll spare you all. <laughs> okay. um, um, sure. So I'm all right. I'm going to ask you all to to walk with me <laughs> and um, in my thinking process. Because actually, um, Dr. Matt, before you read the Roy quote, I was actually thinking about um, Ruthie Gilmore when she mm -hmm. talks about um, the prison system as a geographical solution to a social problem. And um, I was thinking with that about that with regard to you know how oftentimes not just museums, but public history institutions or cultural heritage sites sort of try and address social, ontological, epistemological, all sorts of problems through geography, i.e. putting in a chapter in a book, right? Putting in an exhibit on the floor as though like we've included this, this, this narrative that we did not before, um, we're good, right? We, we've sort of fixed this, right? So I was thinking about that. And then I was also thinking about Catherine McKittrick, who really encourages us to move from a biocentric model of thinking and being and living 
and imagining the possibilities of living, i.e. being county, right, like biocentric, to the physiological um, ways in which we can register knowledge um, and being in the world, i.e. when something happens to me or I experience something, it may be ephemeral, it might be affective, but that doesn't mean it's not long lasting and yeah. does not create physical change in my person, right? Yep. So I'm thinking about those two things to think, to say, to say what I want to say with regard to this question. Um, and what, what I think that we're trying to do so that we're not reproducing both of these things, i.e. Ge uh, a geographical solution to a social problem or, you know, count and tally so that we have, you know, included um, historically harmed or historically silenced story um, in um, you know, on the museum floor. What we're really trying to do is figure out how to decenter the what what counts as public history, um, and, and by that, um, really trying to say like, if it's not on the mall, if it's not in Washington D.C., you know, right now it feels like people think that it's not national, you know, or you know, part of this larger narrative and we we're trying to say yes it is and we're also trying to figure out how to sort of um do what ruthie says which is that you know abolition is living in practice like so how do we create these moments these rehearsals um with a workshop on a weekend in Tallahatchie County Mississippi around the Emmett Till Memorial right where there's mutual capacity building going on um where you know perhaps we're doing so I always have to like show books. This is what I do. But like one of my favorite uh, books ah, I've read is Black Future, that. <laughs> um, <laughs> where you know Jenna and Wortham and Kimberly Drew like sort of put in there like this is how if you want an archive, this is how you do it, right? So, so how do we how do we get folks to to create their own again narratives that are national but locally placed, which I think is very important and a way to sort of get at this this um oscillation that we're, we're we're talking about right now um so anyhow those are those that's my answer to the question for now um yeah it's, that, it's, that's it's amazing challenging <laughs> it is I, I mean it's like the whole notion of post-custodial you know uh, models of 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 curation and and you know yeah. how, how do you build that capacity outside of those four walls and 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 um yeah, like like built that sort of agency from within the, the places from which it, which it came, you know, that mm -hmm. history from which it came. Don't ask to bring it to some centralized uh, hub yeah. that is foreign and may not even reach the people. I mean, I'm thinking of with my mind right now, the photographer, um, I, was, I was gonna say, he's not a photographer, um, Dawood Bay, um, mm -hmm. uh, where he, he talks about the first, the first people that he'll exhibit the photos to before it goes all around the world to these fancy museums and all that is the people that were the subjects and the communities yeah. where yeah. they came from. Um, yeah. And you'd be surprised how, how, how like that sort of praxis of reciprocity is, is missed on, on people. You know, it, it totally flies over the head of, of people that are following the traditions that we've inherited. So, um, so I, re I really appreciate you making that plain. Mm -hmm. Um, are there others that have thoughts about like this notion of reclaim and and um, and, and particularly with your with your projects that you're working through? And if not, it's okay because we went all over the place with this one. <laughs> We're reaching the end of our time soon. Uh, I'll I'll just quickly add that um, you know what Orlando just said about um, projects that are nationally you know, national impact, but locally based, I think a lot about in my work because, you know, right now I've got a couple of projects where what we're dealing with is decisions that were made in urban renewal in the 1960s that usually had pretty harmful effects for communities of color. And now this piece of land is ready to have something done with it. Urban renewal in particular freeway projects displaced over a million people across this country. Um, between the 1950s and 70s, right? Like, so that is a national thing that we have to deal with, but its impacts are so local, right? And, and what these communities feel, it's so local. And so the conversation around what 
reclaim and I would even I think less than reclaim is more like repair right like because we're not trying to get back to where we were before like that yeah. that ship has sailed but like how do we repair how do we mend and how do we support the local conversations to be able to do that and so in many ways what often ends up is like how do we share the stories that people have with this particular piece of land and this particular history and say that that is part of the precondition to be able to move forward. And so I think it's like, what do we do to set up and curate those conversations so that we can get to the place where we create the spaces that tie into some of the things that we've all talked about today? Yeah, that 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 that's amazing. And you know, honestly, my last question here was gonna was gonna be to ask you all what questions you have <laughs> that you're wrestling through um you know in your in your journey um and and you just offered one list so thank you um <laughs> um but but yeah i mean I, i'll close that because we're, we're reaching the end of our time here and i'm not sure i see any any in the q a um so yeah what questions are you all sitting with in your journeys and, and how, how are you um and, and and i guess what 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 is what are the questions that that spark curiosity and you at this point in your development of, of your projects? All right, I'm gonna send mine real quick. Um, because we've been meditating on it over like three months with different folks we brought in to have conversations with us. And really the question is, you know, what are the limits and possibilities of doing this sort of work? um at a national museum that is deeply invested in nation state building um and in ways that we're just not <laughs> quite frankly um and so that we you know and, and, you know and well we you know and the last quote i have is from george jackson right where he says you know if i were forced for the sake of clarity to define fascism in a word simple enough to understand it would be reform. Like we don't want to do that. That's we're not, we don't want to, we want we do not want this system to work more efficiently and better. And we don't want to get caught up in that. So that's mm -hmm. our question. Like how what are the limits and possibilities of doing this kind of work at the place we're trying to do it? Mm -hmm. If you all have other questions, that, that now one last call. If not, um, that was a really powerful, <laughs> powerful way to um, to buttress this this really robust conversation. Um, and I, I'm just grateful that you all um, chose to spend your Tuesday night uh, after a, a holiday weekend for 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 many of us um, together. And um, and I invite everyone who's stuck through with us all to come back for next month's panel. Um, I believe it is the uh, the first Tuesday of August, so August second. Um, and and again, thank you all again for for your for your time, your wisdom, your talent, and your tenacity. So have a good one, everyone.